In a recent video, I talked about how some folks who practice Torahism, also known as Hebrew roots or, or Torah observant Christianity, they deny the deity of Christ. And I'll link to that video below. Well, the divinity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity go hand in hand. So anyone who denies the divinity of Jesus naturally also rejects the Trinity. Although I would say the majority of Torah-keeping Christians accept the Trinity, there are enough who reject it that I want it to at least put out a video on the topic. And since there are so many common misunderstandings, it's important for me to say this right up front. So please listen carefully. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that there is one God and one God alone, and that He is of a triune or three-part nature. No Trinitarian in the world believes there's more than one God, okay? According to James 2.19, even the demons believe God is one and they shudder. So anyone who accuses Trinitarians of believing in more than one God or, or idolatry for worshiping Jesus just doesn't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And as we're going to see, this idea of one God and one God alone, who is of a triune nature, is exactly what Scripture teaches. I'll be honest, the Trinity is a concept I have trouble fully understanding. It's, it's taught in Scripture, and it's a logically coherent concept, so I accept it as true. But like the dual natures of Yeshua, how it's possible is a mystery. I mean, the concept of a single God with a triune nature really has no analog in the known physical world. But I don't think we should be surprised that an infinite creator God who spoke the very universe into being is an entity that our human finite minds can't completely comprehend. The best and the brightest scientists of our age can't even figure out how gravity works. Or, or how wild animals know precisely where to go every year when they migrate across hundreds of miles. So how can we expect to understand everything about God, who is the creator of gravity and migratory animals? Now, the word Trinity means tri-unity, and it refers to a three-part unity. You won't find the word anywhere in the Bible, but the concept is taught in many passages is something that God has revealed progressively over time. So while the Trinity doesn't come into full focus until Jesus, it's hinted at in various ways throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament. In fact, an argument could be made that we get a glimpse of the Trinity in the opening verses of the very first book. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. This passage hints at a plurality in God. The Father is speaking, and the Spirit is hovering over the waters. And that plurality becomes even more pronounced in the New Testament. In John chapter 1, which is patterned after Genesis 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. So Jesus is the Word through whom all things were created. Colossians 1 teaches the same thing. For by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. So in Genesis chapter 1, when we read the phrase, And God said... Are we seeing the Son, Jesus, manifest as the Word spoken by God? Maybe. It's at least a compelling picture of the plurality of God. And a few verses later, God says, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So why is this passage written in the plural? Now, a Hebrew roots friend of mine suggested this is the use of the majestic plural. You know, sometimes they call it the royal we. Like when, when Queen Victoria said, We are not amused, <laughs> referring to herself. But the problem with that is there are no instances of a monarch speaking this way in all of Old Testament Hebrew. And I've heard other folks suggest that when God says us, he's just speaking of himself and the angels around him. But scripture doesn't teach that man was made in the image of angels, nor that angels participated in the creation of man. 
Something else is at play here when God says, let us make man in our image. Now, this verse is a long way from a formal doctrine of the Trinity, of course, but it suggests another intriguing picture of a plural Godhead. Then there's also the mysterious story in Genesis 18, where three visitors visit Abraham bearing prophetic news. And I'll link to another video I made on this passage that goes into more depth. But basically, throughout the passage, the author refers to these three visitors using plural pronouns, right? Them and they. But he also refers to the three men collectively as Yahweh. In other words, the passage portrays God appearing to Abraham as three men. Now, I'm not saying this is proof of the Trinity, but it's another intriguing picture of God. And interestingly, Jewish scholar Benjamin Sommer agrees with that assessment. He said this, We Jews have always tended to sort of make fun of the Trinity. Oh, how can there be three that is one? Um, if they've got this three-part God, even if they call it a triune God, a, a God that is three yet one, really, really they're pagans. They're not real monotheists like we Jews. So actually, one of the more radical conclusions that I came to, much to my own surprise, when I was writing this book, and this is not at all what I had intended to do, because in various ways that we could discuss if you're interested, I'm actually rather uncomfortable with my own conclusion here, but as a scholar, I got to call him as I see him. Um, one of the conclusions that I came to, to my shock when I finished this book, is that we Jews have no theological objection to the doctrine of the Trinity. Theologically, I think that the model of the Trinity is an old ancient Near Eastern idea that shows up in the Tanakh and that in a different way shows up in Jewish mysticism as well. Fundamentally, the theological model used by the Christianity, I think, is, a, is one model that shows up in our own sacred literature. It, it, it's interesting, if you read some of the church fathers or some Christian commentators on the story of Abraham and the three visitors, they make a linkage between that story and the doctrine of the Trinity. Those three visitors become a harbinger of, a hint at the later idea of the Trinity. And you know what? This is one of those cases of a much later writer saying something that seems very removed from the text, but actually at some very deep level, they're really correct that there is a linkage between the Trinity, the, the theological intuition that's behind the idea of the Trinity and the theological intuition that is behind the story in Genesis 18. So even Jewish scholars recognize that the theological intuition behind the Trinity is found in the Jewish Bible. But there's more. When our Hebrew roots friends, or even our Jewish friends for that matter, object to the Trinity, they're usually viewing the concept through the lens of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And in particular, they have the Shema in mind, which is the prayer from Deuteronomy 6 that begins with the words, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And it goes on to say, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, not only is this the most foundational passage in all of Judaism, it's also the passage that Jesus taught as the greatest commandment. In light of that, the big question becomes, how could so many first century Jews have accepted the worship of Jesus and not felt they were violating the Shema, which says that God is one? And by extension, how can we today accept the worship of Jesus and not be violating the Shema? Well, there's a doctrine called two powers in heaven that was once part of Jewish theology that explains how this could be. And most modern Jews and Torah-keeping Christians are just aren't aware of the understanding of the Godhead that was held by Jews at the time of Jesus. So how did this work in the first century Jewish mind? Let me give you three quick examples from the Tanakh that show where this idea came from. We'll start with Genesis 19, 24, which says, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire from the Lord out of heaven. Does anything strike you as unusual about that verse? The Lord is raining down fire from the Lord. So God's name is used twice in the same verse, and they look like two different figures. Ancient Jewish thinkers noticed this. And here's another one, Exodus 15.3. This is from the Song of Moses after they go through the Red Sea. It says, 
The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, many modern Christian translations render this text into English as, The Lord is a warrior. And Jewish translations will say something like, The Lord is a master of war. And neither are really wrong, but look at the Hebrew. It says, The Lord is an ish milchama, a man, ish is the Hebrew word for man, of war. And since other passages in the Jewish Bible show God as this transcendent being living in the heavens, this verse stood out. And lastly, there's the scene in Daniel 7, starting at verse 9. As I looked on, thrones, notice it's plural, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His garment was like white snow, and the hair of his head like lamb's wool. His throne was tongues of flame. Its wheels were blazing fire. This is language from Ezekiel 1. So we know that the Ancient of Days in this scene is the God of Israel seated on his throne. And then the scene continues, picking up at verse 13. As I looked on in the night vision, one like a human being came with the clouds of heaven. He reached the Ancient of Days and was presented to him. So there are two figures here. We have the Ancient of Days, which is God, and then another guy who came with the clouds of heaven. So who's this other guy, the, the one like a human being? And why, ancient Jewish thinkers wondered, why in verse 14 does it say, of this other guy, and he gave him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, nations, and tongues shall serve him. His dominion is an eternal dominion. Okay, so these are three fundamental passages in the forming of this ancient Jewish theology of one God with a plural nature. Scholars refer to this view as Jewish binatarian monotheism. And this was the, the theological understanding through which early Jews could affirm the Shema and the oneness of God, and at the same time understand the resurrected Yeshua as divine. They saw him as the second power in heaven. So when the ancient Jews read passages like 1 Samuel 3.10, which literally says, The Lord came and stood before Samuel, it readied their hearts for when the Apostle John would later write, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And by the way, the scholar who discovered this ancient Jewish theology wasn't a Christian. He was a Jew named Alan Segal, and he published his work in 1977 in a book called Two Powers in Heaven. He knew this was a, a discussion among the ancient thinkers, so he carefully traced the roots of the teaching and showed that this two powers idea was an accepted part of Jewish theology during the time of Jesus. It wasn't deemed heretical by the rabbis until the second century when belief in Yeshua had already begun spreading. So why is any of this important? Because to deny any part of the Trinity is to deny a part of Holy Scripture. Scripture teaches five truths that we have to hold in tension as being true all at the same time. And these five truths are, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct from one another, and God is one. Now, it may be hard for our finite minds to grasp what this entirely means, but the amount of scriptural data supporting each of these five statements is overwhelming. And they're harmonized logically in the Christian teaching that there is one God and one God alone, and He is triune in nature. But don't take my word for it. Let's take a look at some examples from Scripture. First, there are passages where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned together and share divine status. For example, Matthew 28, Jesus says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So, why did Jesus command that believers be baptized in three names, not one? And in John 15, Jesus teaches, but when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. This verse mentions three different entities. So first, there's the Helper who proceeds from the Father and, and will bear witness about Jesus. Then there's the Father from whom the Helper proceeds. And then there's the Son, Jesus, who sends the Helper and about whom the Helper bears witness. 
So how do we make sense of this passage outside of a plural Godhead? Secondly, if the concept of the Trinity isn't true, then many of Yeshua's teachings are rendered illogical. For example, in John 14, he tells his disciples, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Now, in this passage, Jesus again asserts three distinct divine entities, right? The Son tells us that the Father will send the Holy Spirit, right? So, Jesus chose his words to indicate that in addition to himself, there is another who will send and yet another who will be sent. And it's clear that each of these three entities or, or persons must be divine based on their functions. And I think maybe the most explicit example of this is found in Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So once again, this is a passage that reveals three distinct entities. The Father, God, speaks from heaven. The Son, who we also know as divine, is being baptized on earth. And then the Holy Spirit, who we know as the Spirit of God himself, descends from the Father to rest on the Son. And at the same time, we know that God is one, right? Without the concept of the Trinity, this passage either becomes nonsensical or it teaches three different gods. But with the Trinity, this is a beautiful picture of a triune God at work in his universe. And it's in these passages and many others like them that we begin to see the, the three key theological strands that Scripture weaves together into a tight doctrinal cord, right? There is only one God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct from one another, and yet they're each divine. When it comes to the Trinity, to me, even more captivating than the mystery of how is the majesty of why. As Zacharias notes, if God ever says he loves, who is he loving before creation? If God says he speaks, who is he speaking to before creation? Both communication and love are contained in the Godhead right from the beginning. It's only in the Christian faith that love precedes life. In every other belief system, life precedes love. What an amazing statement. In, in non-Christian worldviews, love is merely a human concept that came about after mankind arrived on the scene. And if love didn't exist prior to humanity, then God existed without love for a past eternity. And then humans can define love however they want. But that's not the biblical concept of love. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. So scripture teaches that God is eternal and God is love. Therefore, love is eternal. Said another way, God has always existed, so love has always existed. However, love can only exist in a relationship between persons. So for love to be past eternal, there must be past eternal persons in a relationship. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity says that love has existed eternally in the triune relationship within the Godhead. And this is what we see on the, on the pages of the New Testament. God the Father allocates all things to the Son, His authority, His power over life, His judgment, and yet the Son won't do anything by Himself. He'll only do what He sees the Father doing. And the Spirit doesn't speak about Himself or, or seek His own glory. He brings glory to Jesus by taking what the Father gave to Jesus and showing it to us. So the Trinity is three self-giving persons within the one true God, who have been expressing love literally eternally. And this is what we turn our backs on if we deny the Trinity. We deny the very nature of God and undermine the true biblical meaning of love. 
Now, I know only a minority of Torah keepers deny the Trinity, but it's an overtly heretical position to take, so I wanted to weigh in on it. And although it's hard for our, our finite minds to just grasp what it fully means, at least it is for me, the amount of scriptural data supporting the idea of a triune God is staggering. The only logical, coherent way to deny the Trinity is to also deny the New Testament, which Judaism does. But if we accept the New Testament as the inspired Word of God, as I do, and most of Torahism does, it's irrational to try then to deny the Trinity. Scripture teaches that there is one God and one God alone, and that He is triune in nature. Thanks for watching. Shalom.